Hi, and welcome to the Indie Music Podcast, the podcast for independent musicians and other audio professionals. We're your hosts. I'm Matt Denton, also known as Mojo of Ragged Birds Music. I'm a Bay Area mix engineer and recording artist. And Douglas Reynolds of Resonance Mastering, a mastering engineer in Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome to episode 205 of the Indie Music Podcast. Tonight, we'll be talking about focusing on what makes you happy in your music business, or any business for that matter. Do you have an alignment of your passions with your work? Then we'll move into a discussion on managing revisions and revisions policies. Enjoy the episode. Now you've got your silky smooth thing going. (laughs) Yeah, silky smooth. You'd think I'd never done this before instead of, you know, like a (laughs) hundred times or however many we've done this. (laughs) Get it together. How you doing? We haven't talked all day. I'm, I'm doing good. It's very busy. I just like went out of one session into this podcast session. So it's oh, just like oh, studio busy. Studio. Good. <laughs> good, good. No, I'm, I'm work busy. I thought yesterday morning was Thursday because <laughs> I've, I, I've done so much already this week that I'm, I thought that, that you know, this, this how weeks, some weeks go. It's fine. I've asked for a week off in two weeks. Cause I'm like, I just, I need the time. I have the time. I I, I need a break. <laughs> I don't know that. I don't know. There've, I've got so much work coming in that there's no foreseeable break. Interesting. Which is good. And then the podcast is like a break, actually. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I always feel myself kind of decompressing as soon as I get the headphones on. Oh, well, that's, we that's session, cool. But that's cool. Yeah. I guess that sounds like a little bit like, be careful what you wish for. I mean, you set up your whole little world there around mastering and then suddenly <laughs> <laughs> it's like opening the closet and having everything fall on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really good and not complaining at all. It, uh, I will probably have to figure out how to plan some downtime and yeah. Or it might just happen organically. You know, it, it, things happen in cycles. So True. they tend to anyway. But we'll see. It was um, the whole, I guess I can't, I can't stress enough how that focusing and working in a niche has always proved to be the better business decision for, for me and the, and the businesses that I've been in than trying to be so diversified to try to do a lot of things. And it kind of is counterintuitive because you would think that if I'm offering so many things, then I can grab from here and there, you know, right. and have different sources of business and revenue and things like that. But I think that that leads down a path of a lack of like focus and and you get into a a broad base with no depth to it interesting if you know what i mean i can see that yeah i know what you mean whereas when you focus your attention somewhere and you really grind into it it gives you the opportunity to build that into a really a deep foundation and which has nothing to do with our topic tonight but (laughs) no but it's a good lesson (laughs) I, i i like that about our podcast that we have that we that there's nuggets of you know nuggets of goodness nuggets of wisdom uh, sprinkled throughout that may or may not have anything directly to do with the topic but they have they have uh, to do with you know the broader sense of us you know just trying to have everybody be more successful in general I think yeah and I don't know what that how does that translate what do you think that means in terms of music creation you think that focus within a a genre within a style focusing on yourself and your own style versus trying to diversify out into lots of different types of music. I suppose over time people do that though. You know, they, I was going to say, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I heard this on like the Andy J pizza podcast, which I love, which is the creative pep talk podcast. And he talks all the time about the hero's journey and, um, and his, his podcast is so enlightening and just so ins- inspirational. And 
I'd always thought of the hero's journey as something that you do over the course of your lifetime, like, and then you have to figure out what stage you're in. And uh, un until he mentioned it, I it didn't occur to me that you could have multiple hero's journeys throughout your lifetime. And I think that part of the journey uh, as a creative person and maybe even just as a working person, you have to, at the beginning of your journey, whether that's, you know, your life journey, your next year journey, this week journey, maybe even, um, figure out what you're going to do. And when you're going to figure out what you're going to do, you kind of have to treat life or your work a little bit like a buffet. Well, I got to try this. I got to try that. I got to try this. What do you gravitate towards? What tastes good? What tickles your fancy? What what do you excel at? And at some point, I think, regardless of what you set out to do, you kind of organically find the place where you're supposed to be, the place where, you know, your, your, your talent, your passion combine. And whether that's, okay, I, I'm, I just made an album and now I'm going to make a new album. Uh, I want it to be different than the last one. I'm going to go, you know, like, uh, I was just listening to, um, Paul Simon, remember he famously went to Africa yeah. to look for new sounds and came back and made one of the best selling albums of all times because he got inspired by trying new things, but then he niched back down and then he went and did it again in South America. But I mean, it's like you got to broaden and then focus and broaden and then focus. And I think that what you're saying is that at this part of your journey, you have um, gone from broad to focus and it's, and it's working great for you. I think that that is true no matter what you do but i think you do have to start broad and then focus down and when you do focus by the time you focus i think um you have um like the universe is on your side i guess is, I, I hear that a lot yeah um, but you can I mentioned it in my newsletter i was searching for what what makes me the happiest yeah and and i think that it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with business and has more to do with your engagement in your own business, whatever that may right. be. And if you're happy doing that, that correlates to having, it's going to have success regardless of what happens in the business, you're going to be happy doing it, which is the point, <laughs> you know? Yes. yes. <laughs> and, you know, we want to make a living. It's no fun making a living, doing things that don't make you happy. That's right. Drudgery you know, um, where you're walking with the purpose through something. Well, I want to enjoy the walk and not necessarily feel like I'm having to have a lot of effort in order to do that. Yeah. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I think we were just, yeah, totally. We were just watching TV the other day. And, you know, we don't usually watch broadcast television, but of course it was, football was on. And there was a, a commercial for, I'll just say a fast food chain, and the guy, and it was like, you know, one of those candid commercials where they're interviewing one of the guys in a stylistic fashion who was preparing some food. And he just seemed like he was really into it, like really enjoying himself and just happy to, to do his job well and please a customer. And my wife was like, wow, I, I really love it when somebody loves what they do. It just shows. It just, it, it just makes everything better. And I think that's part and parcel of what you're talking about. It's like once you have that thing that resonates and you just have that thing that you know, it, yeah, like I was saying, it, it's a kind of a when you wear your passion and your skills combine, and it just everything just kind of it's like a tuning fork, you know, it's like two strings that are suddenly making a chord, you know. I think that must become outwardly obvious. I think so. Where others see that in you. Um, I'm not sure how that really works, but it your demeanor and the way you present yourself and the quality of your service and product. I think those things would tend to suffer if you're not enjoying yourself and it's like, Oh, I got to go get this done. And right. And your, your heart's not in it. Well, that may result in less quality in whatever it is that you're delivering. I think it has to like by nature, like, I think what we're talking about is alignment. Yeah. When things are aligned, I think that everything just kind of vibrates and resonates uh, in, a, in a way that affects everything. And I think that's true when it, there's discord. Um, when you're when you're not in alignment with the thing that you do, I think it shows you you resist doing things, and you know you are late getting stuff back, and you're you know you resist doing the work in the first place. I think that that's that's part of a misalignment, and uh, yeah, I think. 
that, that does. It's two sides of a, of a coin there. Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad topic. It's not what we were planning on talking about, but it's, uh, I wouldn't know where to go from there. But, yeah. um, but speaking of, of doing a good job and getting things back, we were going to talk tonight about revisions. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, since since it was your thought, I will uh, cede the floor and let you have some <laughs> have some thoughts about um, oh, what you want to say about that. Well, I don't know if it's if it's a rant or not, but <laughs> I don't get I don't get charging for more than in revisions. I don't. That doesn't make sense to me, and. Because I think that that is putting a limitation on communication and feedback and a collaborative experience with your customers, with your clients. And I've seen so many, there's more of a concern with how much work am I going to have to put into this versus I want to deliver exactly what myself and my client want in the end. Right. And, I agree with that. And to do that, I guess where I come from is it's a whatever it takes mentality, a whatever it takes to get there. And in my mission, it is I'm not done until you're delighted. Okay. Yep. And so the whole aspect of, yeah, so what if it's the third revision or the fourth revision or something like that? We're working together on something. You're, I'm giving you something. You're giving me information back that's trying to express how you feel about it and what you would like for it to become after this cycle of communication. And, yeah. and so I, I told you um, that I do have kind of an informal policy that if, hey, if we hit three, there's, and this is because I feel that there's a lack of communication or there's an inability to actually understand what the other is really trying to go for. Okay. Right, a communication mismatch, which yeah. is something we did talk about before. Yeah, and at which point in time it needs to get more face to face. Yes. So I do, and in these times that's very difficult. And right, <laughs> but that's okay because the majority of my work, regardless of a pandemic, is remote, and so I have to have tools. You know, we have Zoom. Yeah, there's a great and tool. everybody's used to using it now. Yeah. And you know, and other tools and. Whatever the, whatever the case may be, but that's not even a tool I use with my clients. Uh, but I do incorporate remote sessions. And yeah. so the client and I can sit down together as if they were in my studio and listen at the same time, give or take five or six milliseconds, okay? And sure. I can actually make live changes and they can listen to them and I can get live feedback. They can tell me what they're wanting. I can try to make moves that in the way that I understand what they're telling me that I, I think correlates to uh, what it is that they want. And then we're really working on that together. And that can help limit the churning of revisions that are continuing on. Right, the back and forth, which yeah. just takes time because you have to generate something. They have to take the time to listen to it. Maybe they have a band member they need to consult with. Maybe they're not the final word. That just because they're the, the the person who's the who, that you talk to, they might not have the final word. And and uh, yeah, it all takes time. It's, it stretches it out. Yeah, someone said this last week. It's like throwing an uh, an idea, or it's trying to throw something over a wall that's between you, right? And hope that they catch it on the other side. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It can be like that. Now, this is one of those situations where I wish that I had the opposite opinion of you, so that we could have a spirited debate about <laughs> this, or I could I could give an opposing viewpoint and we could discuss it. Um, <laughs> but I, I totally agree with you. I was I was advised early on um, that a standard practice was to you know, or, or not a standard practice, but a, a accepted practice was to do three revisions. And after that you charge. And I kind of wrote that down. I thought I don't, that doesn't sit well with me. And I, I kind of feel like anybody who says that is basically punishing their future customers for a bad client that they had in the past. Yeah. Like somebody who was trying to get something for free or somebody who kept changing their mind or couldn't make up their mind or ask for one thing. And then uh, ask for it to go back the other way or just 
didn't understand the process, but I feel like that's, you're just punishing your future customers for that. And I'm totally like, I will do it until it's done the way you like it. And unless you're happy, it's not finished. Yeah. Um, and I know you're the same way. And yeah, I, I, I also have the ability and should jump on it more quickly. I think, um, to do live mix sessions, I do use zoom and then I use audio movers to do live here. Listen to this. We'll make tweaks in real time. Yeah. Um, and that's a good tool. And I think people just because of the last several months are used to working remotely. And I don't think it's a, I don't think it's the barrier that it was. I think people have come to accept it and will in the future. But um, yeah, I don't understand that either. The whole charging more, because maybe, maybe you're not that good. Maybe you need the practice. Maybe you need to go back to the drawing board and go, Hey, I need to work on something. And I'm certainly not going to kick the charge for that back to my customer. If it's, if it's on me that I didn't get it right the first time, that doesn't make any sense. Right. And now on the other side of that, it, by being, let's see, how do I want to phrase that? By being willing to do whatever it takes, doesn't mean that you roll over on your back True. and become submissive and do everything that your client says they want, because you are also the professional doing what it is that you do that needs to advise your client from your expertise as to what they need. Right. Because right. what they want and what they need may not be the same thing. And there may be True. very good reasons that they can't have what they want. And or there's a compromise that needs to be made between the needs of the music and, and the wants of the client for the music. Right. From a from a mixing perspective, an easy uh, example of that would be I wanted to sound like it was you know, recorded at, you know, Blackbird Studio when I actually recorded it in my living room with, uh, you know, not the best equipment or best situation. <laughs> and why doesn't it sound like a professional record? Well, you can do, you know, so much with uh, what, I mean, your soup is going to taste as good as the ingredients that went into it, right? Right. Um, I mean, you can you can do great things, but maybe you can't make complete magic sometimes uh yeah. based so on limitations on the source material is one that's a better way to put it <laughs> <laughs> there could be limitations in the distribution environments no okay example you don't want it to be negative two db luffs okay no you, you really don't i know you want it to be really loud but it's not what you need it's not what the song needs it's going to cause problems in different areas of where you're distributing the music. That's why there's a volume knob. Yeah. <laughs> Just but, if you want it louder, turn it up. Yeah, true. I mean, there's certainly, <laughs> I've come to believe that volume level is, is genre dependent. Okay. And yeah, but there's a lot to be had in subtleties in quietness with dynamics versus brick walled with no dynamics, you know? Right. But the latter lends itself wonderfully to heavy metal and and hard rock genres and things like that. Whereas folk and blues and jazz and things, it's really all in the subtlety and the dynamics. And we want to preserve that. Right. I love to hear the fingers on the strings in a quiet song. Sure. So things like that. If you start losing those attributes because of something that's been requested from the client, it's it, well, for me, it's my job to say no. That's not the right thing to do. And yeah, okay but you should, but as a professional, you would want to have a, a good reason. Like, here's here's why that's not a good idea. Yeah. Well, I, I was explaining why it wasn't a good <laughs> idea before I said no. <laughs> I don't oh, say boy. no and then say why. I say why and then say no. Yeah, that's a better plan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was thinking that, you know, of course, not everybody listening um, has clients, but maybe they have collaborators. Maybe they deal with revisions with stuff that they're being asked to contribute. Say, hey, can you make a guitar lick or hey, can you make a drum beat uh, to go with this song? And how do you deal with um, revisions there uh, when it's a, more of a creative environment rather than a client um, service provider environment? How do you, what's your take on that? Well, in one case, you're either the right musician for the gig or you're not. True. Depending on what you play and how you play and what the expectations from the producer are. The other is how well prepared you are for the gig, for the recording, 
session, whatever. Um, you could be completely capable, but entirely unprepared, unpracticed. And that's a matter of like personal care and dedication or something like that, or, mm -hmm. or what? So you, you could have a completely different vision of what you think it should sound like versus which is the same situation we were just talking about. Oh yeah. That's, that's an excellent point and a way to bring that back around. I think vision has a lot to do with it. And I think vision, th I think that that's part of uh, what causes communication breakdowns when you're saying one thing and I'm hearing a different thing it's because we have different visions and we're not communicating them properly. Either that or I make assumptions about what you said. And that, that is when a live session is kind of a, a fix for that because you can hear in real time, hey, no, that's not what I was talking about. Or, hey, more like this. And I think that would probably work also for, um, for the other situation, like a session musician situation, when you're not throwing something over a wall and hoping that they catch it on the other side. Yeah. In that respect, oftentimes, and probably most of the time, a session musician is hired because of how they play. Right. They've gone, that guy, I love the way he sounds, and I want that sound on my album, adapted to the music that I'm playing. But it seems like it's in the style of you playing in this genre of music, because guys like Larry Carlton sound like Larry Carlton, you know what I mean? Right. And whoever. I think they're getting hired at that level for who they are and how they play. Even, I can't think of his name right now. Who's our favorite session guitar I know, player? I'm, he's, I'm picturing his face right now and I, I can't remember <laughs> his name. I thought that was who you were going to talk yeah, about. Yeah, well, I would have if I could have uh, remembered his name. He fits into more session gigs than anybody in the last like 10 years or something. And Tim Pierce. Tim Pierce. Oh, Tim. <laughs> um, I. I had to go to the Google. Thanks. I swear to God, I was picturing him and I can't Thanks. remember. So it. sorry, Tim. It's no disrespect. Sorry, Tim. Man. I mean, love. We love you, we man. We do love you. <laughs> love your smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And, but, you know, Tim, if you've listened to his, his YouTube channel and things like that, and the way he plays and the way he approaches, he's playing to the music, but Tim Pierce is always Tim Pierce. He's right. never trying to be anybody else. And that's because he's niched down. He has his niche. Yeah. He's focused on his one thing that he does well that floats his boat. Yeah. And, you know, he's so good. Yet you can see in him when he's he's got other people on his channel and stuff like that and who are really great themselves. Yep. And how starry eyed he is he's looking at and listening. And he's just like, oh, yeah, getting into and enjoying what the other people are doing, too. Um, well, he's so gracious and yeah. he's so just generous and such a fan of music and life. And it's, it's just, he just beams, he just radiates positive energy. It's just, it's, it's a, he's a delight. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and I think it's part of his success. I think guys like that are extremely adaptable, but they are, they're, they're niche. They have their tone and they have lots of tones that are theirs, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and they're just very versatile players. Yeah, his quiver is full. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet he doesn't get a lot of revisions. Now, he probably, what he gets is what we were talking about last episode, is he gets a brief and notes. Yeah. And he goes from there, and um, he probably sends a few takes, as you do uh, in, say, voiceover or something similar, which is very much like being a session musician, yeah. I think. I mean, you could um, consider each take to be its own revision, too. True. Coming from the perspective of, of a musician. So every time that you, every time that you do a mix down and render, that's, that's a version. Right. And when we're redoing it or we're doing a new version of it, it could be entirely different. I don't know about you, but I have wiped everything in the slate clean and started over before. You know? <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> Sometimes you have to get, you get to that point where you're just too deep in the mud and you're, yeah. you're in the weeds and you're like, you know what? Forget it. Yep. Slash and burn. Start over. <laughs> yep. It, it's an effective uh, strategy sometimes. It, it can be. And you hate to do it because you know by that point you put so much time in. But on the other hand, it doesn't matter if you're running quickly if you're running in the wrong direction. Right. So. Yeah. So each one of those, every time that you do it, every time you do a take, every time that you that you render, 
there's a new version that's a revision. And, you know, so how many takes are you willing to do before you charge more? Well, I mean, I agree with you. I don't, I don't charge more. Um, at some point you do kind of have to go, okay, one of us is missing something here. Let's get on the phone or let's get on the, and you know, I love, I actually love to get on the phone with people and have a discussion and go, Oh, that's what you're talking Obviously. about. Oh, how did you like this part? And, how this? <laughs> and you know, I think people, some people are, <laughs> some people are reluctant to get on the phone. I mean, I used to hate to talk on the phone and now I prefer it because it's just, you know, you can only convey so much through text. I can convey everything I need to through text. You can. It's true. Especially when you have uh, gifts to throw in there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Emoticons. Yes. Um. <laughs> Maybe that's too funny. I'm going to start incorporating uh, those tools into my mastering revisions. <laughs> They're coming, everything's coming with like the, the emoticon that I'm feeling right here. We're going to convey. It. <laughs> yeah. The, the metadata has all of the emojis that you felt while you were working on the project. Yeah, as the, you know, each successive revision, <laughs> the emoji is a little less happy every time. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with the open face yeah. and goes to a smile. Then the, the nonplussed flat line face. Yeah. <laughs> all the way down to the, to all the, the scream. Right. And then the skull. <laughs> I'm dead. I can't work on this anymore. <laughs> oh, it does help to love it. Yeah. It does help to hear the song. And uh, to even if you, even if it's not necessarily your bag right off the bat, it does help to, to find something in it that you can love about it. And then kind of, I don't know, not fall in love with it, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's possible to love an ugly baby, you know? It's, <laughs> it is possible, to, but mostly only when it's yours, yeah. but um, <laughs> unless you're a nurse, but that's, a, that's a tangent. Um, but yeah, once you, once you love it, then you want the best for it. And then you try to make it the best. Now, of course, parenting styles are different. And I know this is a metaphor, but you know, it does hurt a little when you, when you want something for it, and you think that you've made it the best it can be based on kind of your own taste. And then they say, no, that's not what we wanted. Yeah. We, want, we want our baby to be uglier. You made it too pretty. Wipe that makeup off. It immediately makes me think, oh, you want more mid-range. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, really. I don't know why, but I just, I absolutely had this, do you know, it, there's a feeling of different, areas of the spectrum you know what i mean and, and mid yeah. mid-range has this feeling and now i'll never think of mid-range without the ugly <laughs> <laughs> your baby's ugly it needs a little more mid-range <laughs> well that's why i um i have a preset i mean i have the sitting right next to me i have this baritone which is an oratone speaker um oh, i thought you were gonna basically clone say you had like an ugly baby preset well, I do have, and that's what I was going to say. I, I took, I, I'm, instead of using the baritone, which is sitting right here, because I have to plug it and unplug it and turn it on. I, um, I have, uh, I have made, I've used the, you know, the frequency curve from the manual of this, of this little speaker. I, I made my own EQ preset called bad speaker. <laughs> and uh, in addition to, you know, working, you know, testing in mono and low volume and high volume, I play it on the bad speaker uh, preset um, before I even take it out of here and play it on my phone and Alexa and earbuds and all that stuff to see if I can hear the whole song with the top and the bottom removed, oh. you know, because that's basically what it is. It's a bell curve more or less. Right. Um, it's the opposite. It, it's a sad face. It's a sad, it's not the, it's the smile. <laughs> it's not the smile curve. It's the sad curve. It it's the sad curve for a bad speaker. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, if, if you're, if you can hear the whole song and it sounds decent, um, through the, through the frown curve, um, it's, it's probably going to translate. Okay. On, on a lot of places. You could call it, it could be like the NS 10 frown curve or something like that. It kind of is. Yeah. The, the oratone frown curve yeah. basically, <laughs> um, because it is, it's a, it's a mono bad speaker. And uh, I should listen to it more because I haven't actually, I haven't, I have it sitting here and it's basically a pencil stand. <laughs> I have my, I have my uh, interface on top of it and then my, you know, my mug of pencils on top of that. Um, it's actually, but a, I haven't actually plugged speaker? it in. 
Well, it's a baritone, so it's Behringer's clone of the Oratone because oh, okay. those went off the market. Um, and well, those are designed to be like a center mono, aren't they? Yeah, it's it's a it's a single speaker. It's a like a mid range, yeah. but it has the it has that, that that quality of a of a just kind of a generic blah speaker. That if your mix translates through that, then you're doing something right. Well, that's what NS tens are popular for. Right. Um, but like I was saying, I have not yet in this space. Now that this space is built out, sound treated, and calibrated, I have not plugged it in yet <laughs> to listen to what stuff sounds like. I will I'll put that on my list for for this week yeah if that. i had one i would definitely have it right in the center of my desk you know in some way to through a monitor controller or whatever be able to flip back and forth yeah that that's a good check yeah i'm putting that on my list <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'll get one of those monitors because i mean in your DAW, you could just set your your master bus to mono if you don't have a, a controller that'll do that for you externally and just run mono through it yeah i use the um the boz uh, they have a free plugin called Manipulator, oh. which allows you to flip um, left and right. It allows you to do mono. Um, it's just a, a cool free plugin, and I just have that on my template on my master bus so that I can do a quick mono check. I've actually used that plugin because it can do left, right, and turn. It can it can do a, you know the plus three um, for if you turn. You know how mono is three decibels louder than stereo. Yeah. Um, I've actually taken somebody who will have sent me a stereo guitar track that should have been a mono guitar track and i've taken it to mute one channel and um, make it only one size so that i can make it mono it's, it's actually that kind of plugin can be versatile if you get creative with yeah it. well i've got a plugin like that too it, it's made by flux and if you know flux they make great plugins and this is a free one so what's that one called i Since probably have listeners it. <laughs> you've hung out this long flux stereo tool version three is free you have to register i think you know, so for giving up your email, you can get a, a cool plugin, which is basically a, a stereo visualizer, but then it gives you the ability to, to go mono and flip left or right. And that's pretty handy. That's cool. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's helpful uh, on the stereo bus t- to swap left and right. Yeah. And it, it if uh, you've been listening to a mixer or a master for a while, you get used to it sounding a certain way. And when you flip it left, right, boy, the things that jump out that you had kind of not noticed or not paid attention to is kind of amazing. Sometimes it's actually louder on one side than the other, but you didn't realize it. Yeah. Um, all kinds of things. You can actually attenuate left or right independently of each other on this as well. And then obviously it's not just one single face, which you can swap phase well, you could swap phase of both and flip them yes. completely inverse. It still matched. It would still sound good, but you would just be putting everything in the right channel over into the left. But, you know, or one or the other. So anyway, it's it's a pretty neat tool. That's cool. Yeah, that uh, manipulator does the same thing, but I'll, I'm going to check out that Flux. I like Flux plugins. Yep. It's high quality stuff. Well, I think <laughs> I think we covered <laughs> our topic and then some. What do you think, Doug? I think we did. <laughs> And I think we have uh, another interview next week, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, we do have an interview coming up, and we'll uh, we'll have some uh, we'll promo that out on our social media channels here in the next day or two. Yeah, I'm excited about the new promo strategy. It's it's cool. We got some cool new graphics, and we're getting some a little better outreach. Uh, I'm just happy to have more people listening um, than before because uh, I think you know I think we put out a quality broadcast. Yeah. We get we get compliments <laughs> for people who. Uh, you know, whether they're hearing it by accident or not, we're, we get compliments from people who, you know, run across it. Which is like baffles me. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to listen to us? I don't know. I just wanted to talk to my buddy for an hour every week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I know. Now I don't want to get off the, I don't want to get off the phone here. <laughs> it's like, I can't say bye right now. Not yet. Uh, no, you hang up. <laughs> <No>, you. <laughs> No, you hang up. <laughs> hey, you know what's cool? Usually, I go, I go. Okay, I gotta, I gotta jump off because I gotta go make dinner. Um, my family has instituted a new. Um, they're gonna make dinner on Wednesday nights thing, and this is the first night, so <laughs> I'm curious to see what I'm gonna walk into when I go in the house because um, normally I'm the cook, and uh, this is uh, gonna be. I'll let you know next. All right, week how that went. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. Feel free to um, leave us a comment, uh, give us a review, and uh, please tell your friends and let us know and let them know uh, 
that we have a podcast and it's cool. Yep. Have a great week. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. Have a great week. Bye guys. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Indie Music Podcast. Please like and subscribe, share with your friends, or just leave us a review on iTunes if you like what you've heard. Find our social links and episode guide at IndieMusicCast.com. Until next time, keep creating.